Good afternoon in New York. Good evening in Ukraine. United Kingdom in Europe, Israel in Africa. And welcome whatever time of day or night for all who are joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Dr. Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention, and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Held in observance of the 37th anniversary of Chernobyl disaster of April 26, 1986. In this ICMGLT webinar, Ukrainian and international multidisciplinary experts will share their own experiences, examine cumulative and, inter cumulative and intergenerational effects of this devastating event and its aftermath, and reflect on lessons they have learned. In our current nightmarish reality, merely days ago, Rafael Grossi, the International Atomic Energy Agency Director General, concluded his latest visit to the Russian-occupied Japorizhia nuclear power plant, that was 30 March, urging us to expect, quotes, a more dangerous phase while Vladimir Putin intermittently asserting that he would, quote, defend himself, quote, with nuclear weapons, most recently agreeing with Alexander Lukashenko to deploy tactical nuclear weapons close to Belarus border with NATO neighboring Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and suspending the Russian Federation's involvement in the New START Treaty. Emphasizing this urgent timeliness, today's discussion will explore parallels with and meanings of living the current tragic traumatizing changes and threats in Ukraine and around the world. This webinar would not have happened if it weren't for the generosity and dedication of ICMGLT's Advisory Council members, Dr. Irina Frankova, who is also co-chair of ICMGLT's Working Group on Ukraine, and Ms. Mary Olson. We are thankful as well to our wonderful interpreters, Anna Stemkovska and Natalia Zaets, who are joining us from Kyiv. Your moderator, I am a clinical psychologist, victimologist, traumatologist, and psychohistorian. I devoted much of my career to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma, to victims' rights, to reparative justice, and to articulating history as it is lived rather than it is written about. We are honored to have received Dr. Stanislav Tabachinkov's greetings for our event. A doctor of medical sciences, professor and academician, Dr. Tabachinkov is president of the public organizations National Academy of Sciences of Higher Education of Ukraine, the International Academy of Education and Science, and the Association of Psychotherapists and Psychoanalysts of Ukraine. Our first formal and second speaker, Dr. Ian Fraley, is formal, formally a radiation biologist, but first and foremost, a citizen scientist. He has degrees in chemistry and radiation biology and his doctorate 
at Imperial College in London, UK, was on nuclear waste policy, policies. He was chief scientific advisor to the British government's committee on the radiation risks of internal emitters. He is a vice president of the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the UK and is a consultant to governments, NGOs and nuclear activists, both in Europe and in North America. Third would be Mary Olson, founder of the Gender and Radiation Impact Project. Mary served as staff biologist and senior radioactive waste policy analysis, analyst sorry, at US-based Nuclear Information and Resource Service, a national non-governmental organization until her retirement in 2019. She has continued her work as an educator on harm from exposure to ionizing radiation and, and independent findings she made in 2011 oh, uh, that there is disproportionate harm to female bodies compared to males. Mary has advised the state parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and is a member, as I mentioned, of the ICMGLT's Advisory Council. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Oksana Yakushko is a licensed psychologist, psychoanalyst, scholar, professor, and consultant based in Santa Barbara, California, USA. Oksana grew up in Kiev under Soviet rule through the early 1990s. Focusing her clinical and scholarly work on immigrant and refugee mental health, she currently supports efforts to aid Ukrainian against Russian aggression. Oksana lived through the Chernobyl disaster and its Soviet mismanagement in 1986 in Kyiv as a child. Many of her ancestors were directly influenced by century-long Russo-Soviet violence, including the Holodomor and the Gulags. Last but not least is internationally renowned New York-based visual artist Luba Lukova, who is regarded as one of the most original image makers working today. Whether by using an economy of line, color, and text to pinpoint essential themes of humanity, or to succinctly visualize social commentary, her work is undeniably powerful and thought-provoking. Her most recent exhibitions were titled Designing Justice at National Underground Rail Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Protest Gestalt and Shaping Protest at Museum Ohm in Germany. We have two hours for the webinar. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your question to a particular panelist or to the full panel. We begin with Dr. Tabachnikov's greetings on video, as his time is utterly con con consumed preparing for tomorrow's roundtable in Kiev on an echo of Chernobyl, new realities and challenges. Uh, we had the ICMG LT has the honor to be invited to deliver our own greeting to that important meeting tomorrow. Wow. 
the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant that led to Natural irreparable facts, medical, facts. economic, social, and humanitarian consequences. Therefore, the first lesson of the Chernobyl disaster is not to stop the operation of the nuclear power plants, but to further reduce their risks and comply with the international standards of safety and security. The second lesson of the accident of Chernobyl nuclear power plant is the uh, development... Natalia, Natalia, please, not so fast. The second lesson of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is the development of the necessary general standards on the level of radiation under which the various types of products should be uh, prohibited for their use. The third lesson should be considered that the accidents at Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine and Fukushima in Japan shed light on another global problem, the destruction of humanity and all living things in connection with the threat of a missile nuclear war from the Russian Federation. The fourth very important lesson concerns medical preventive activities, namely increasing the stress resistance and resilience of the operational staff of the nuclear power plants based on the experience of the medical rehabilitation team of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine at Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 1986-1987. It should be noted that not only the collapse of the Soviet Union is connected with the events of Chernobyl uh, disaster, but also the further development of democratic foundations uh, in our country, in Ukraine, were the result of this catastrophe in a way. The Chernobyl nuclear factor manifested itself in today's circumstances. As you know, the Russian aggressor, having occupied Chernobyl nuclear power plant at the beginning of this war, held it for some time. And after capturing the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, they traditionally threat to use it as a freed lever. Taking into consideration the everything said before, it is relevant to discuss the current problems of the consequences of the accident at Chernobyl nuclear power plant, social, economic, ecological, medical, and to warn the world community against the occurrence of similar disasters, as well as the prevention of similar ones in the future. I wish you all good health, comfort, well-being, strength, and mostly important, a peaceful sky on the entire globe. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Sebastian Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we can... Uh, we can, uh, t what we will do, I promise, is to put the English interpretation to uh, tomorrow together with the recording of this webinar to all participants. Uh, so you can, uh, you will not lose the substance of doc Dr. Jabachnikov's uh, 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 contribution. Uh, we look very much forward to Dr. Fraley's um, contribution. Please go ahead, Ian. The, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, I am going to, unless the organizer is going to do it differently, I'm going to um, share my screen and um, um, and bring up. Um, my PowerPoint presentation. Can people see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, it's perfect. Oh, good. That's excellent. I'm just um, minimizing this and I'm going to maximize. Um, uh, I'm just going to have to use the screen. <laughs> Slideshow, slideshow. 
the trouble is that um, the I cannot control it because ah here we go get out of this um, great got it okay um, first of all thank you very much to ICLGMT for the invitation to speak to you um, this evening. Um, this is a very, very brief overview of the Chernobyl uh, disaster. Uh, may I explain that the word Chernobyl is spelled is the Ukrainian spelling. Chernobyl is the Russian spelling. I prefer to use the Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, these are some official quotes about the Chernobyl disaster 37 years ago. Um, According to the IAEA, um, it's the, for, the foremost nuclear catastrophe in human history. And uh, WHO then said it's a, by far the worst industrial disaster on record. And um, IPHECA said that it was the radioactivity from Chernobyl was 200 times that from Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. This is the act. The, the scene of the disaster um, taken about a few days after the explosion. Um, if you can see my cursor here, um, this is where a very large building was demolished by the explosion. Um, or there, in fact, there were two explosions. And for 10 days, the graphite in the reactor burned, basically. There was one and a half million kilograms of graphite reactor, and it took 10 days for it all to burn out. During that time, the radionuclides inside the reactor were lofted skywards and created disaster right around the world. This is the dispersal. Here, where my pointer is pointed is Chernobyl. And this is on the first day or so after the accident. This is about three days later or two and a half days later. This is uh, about four days later. This is six days later. This is uh, eight days later. And this is 10 days later. So you can see that the, the radioactive uh, plume had deposited vast amounts of radioactivity, I'll go back, um, across the, all of Europe, basically. And eventually, it traveled right around the Northern Hemisphere. This is a map of the contamination, the resulting contamination in Europe. Uh, Chernobyl is where I'm pointing here. It's on the, um, the meeting point of three countries, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. And as you can see, the contamination was all over the place. Um, if you're asking why the Balkan countries were not included, they were affected, of course is that the, the, the mapping of the contamination took place during the, the Balkan War. And Serbia said, um, these were mapping by helicopter, and the, the Serbian government said, if you helicopters came in, we'll shoot them down. So the mapping didn't include the Balkan countries. Um, effectively speaking, 40% of the land area of Europe was contaminated to high levels. Now, I'm gonna speak about radioactivity here just for a second because uh, I'm an expert on radioactivity and these are the main um, radionuclides which were released. You can see uh, which is brew here of, uh, of highly dangerous radionuclides with their half-lives and the, um, the percentages released. The most dangerous ones were cesium 134, 137, and strontium, which, uh, because they've got very long half lives, as you can see here. Um, all of the countries in Europe were affected. And for example, 85% of Switzerland was affected, Austria, the, similarly, Czechoslovakia, which still existed then, Ireland, Greece, Norway, Germany, Finland, UK. Um, were fairly badly affected. Um, 
uh, of these main radionuclides, cesium remains worldwide, strontium within about 100 kilometers of Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Iodine-131 was important for about three months after the explosion. And there are the long-lived alphas less than 100 kilometers. Now, the European Commission back in 2005 said that, that it is not possible to conclude that there will be any further reduction in, uh, over the next few decades, except due to the decay of cesium and strontium. In other words, we're condemned basically to have cesium and strontium um, across Europe effectively for the next couple of hundred years or so. Health effects. Mm -hmm. Thyroid cancers was an epidemic for thyroid cancers. Leukemias, which are blood cancers. The solid cancers cardiovascular effects and strokes, heritable effects, and we're still picking these up, and mental health and psychosocial effects, which we shall be concentrating on here today. Um, there was, as I say, a, a thyroid cancer epidemic, particularly in Belarus and Ukraine, and you can see the, um, um, the continuing rise uh, from 1986 up to about 1995 here. Now, on to mental health effects. In the 2005 report, and I'm just going to quote this because it um, sums up what the situation is. Um, the IAEA and WHO said that, the, and I'm reading this, the magnitude and scope of the Chernobyl disaster the size of the population and the long-term consequences make it by far the worst industrial disaster on record. It resulted in massive relocation, loss of economic stability, and long-term threats to health in current and future generations. And it resulted in an increased sense of anomie and diminished sense of physical and emotional balance. It may never be possible to disentangle the multiple Chernobyl stressors from those following in its wake. However, the high levels of anxiety and physical symptoms continue to this day. That's 2005. Well, it's the same here in 2023. There's been very few reports on the effects at Chernobyl. This is my own report, which came out I had two reports, one in 2006 and one in 2016. This is the latest one, which was uh, commissioned by the uh, Viennese government um, and which um, um, basically concentrated on the effects in Europe. So, and in my report, I said this, that the Chernobyl accident had profound, profound far-reaching psychosocial effects particularly amongst the half a million or so cleanup workers, the 130,000 evacuees, and the 270,000 people living in highly contaminated areas of Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. That sums it up. Going on, I said that the, the, the main mental health effects were firstly, anxiety about radiation exposures, which uh, resulted in extreme pessimism, depression, apathy, and fatalism feelings of victimhood and social exclusion, and of course, many suicides, particularly due to evacuations and resettlement. Um, uh, the United Nations Development Program in 2002 explicitly considered suicides. There are a number of reports in Estonia and Lithuania which documented the high levels of suicides. I'm going to talk very briefly, uh, one slide only, and about Fukushima because um, it did uh, report psychosocial effects. It, um, the, at Fukushima, about 140,000 people were evacuated, most permanently. There were over 110, um, there were tens of thousands of cases of post trauma stress disorder, PTSD depression and anxiety or disorders, all due to evacuations. 
In fact, there was, uh, according to official reports, by the way, these are I'm quoting to you what um, official Japanese reports said um, a couple of years after the accident. Um, these official reports said that there were about um, just over 2,000 deaths due to evacuations alone, due to ill health and suicides. In addition to that, that's just, those three are just the psychosocial. There were, in addition to that, 5,000 fatal cancers are estimated over the next 60 years. A similar numbers of strokes, cardiovascular diseases, and thyroid cancers. Um, and land-wise, about 8% of Japan, uh, it's about 30,000 square kilometers, um, were contaminated to high levels, and the economic losses are 300 to 500 billion dollars. Now, I'm going to show you two maps here, which are approximately to the same scale. Um, Chernobyl is here, where my cursor is pointing now. You see that, and this is Belarus, south is Ukraine, and over here is Russia. But on the same map is the contamination at Fukushima to the same scale. You can see it's much smaller than the highly contaminated areas in those, these three countries. However, this is only a map of the geographical area. The, the population in these areas are much lower than the population in Japan, okay? So trying to remember that geographically, the contamination was very bad in uh, Chernobyl and relatively small, only 8% of uh, Japan was affected, but the population density in Japan is much higher. Right, um, I'm gonna conclude now um, for Chernobyl. Um, about 40% of Europe was contaminated to high levels. We estimate that in the future, between 30 and 60,000 cancer deaths will arise. We estimate that between 18,000 and 66,000 thyroid cancers will result in Belarus alone. That the, the contamination on the maps I've shown you will remain for hundreds of years in Europe. And that there are serious mental health effects, but few studies. I'm going to mention one particular book um, because it's written by a friend, Professor Kate Brown at uh, MIT in Massachusetts. She wrote a book called Manual for Survival in 2020, which does discuss um, some of the psychosocial effects. I would um, point to that. And in addition to that, I would like to mention the um, uh, the HBO Stroke Sky um, episodes, five episodes, um, which were screened in 2020, just called Chernobyl, um, and recommend that to you if you if you can still get it up or if you can still buy it online. Um, that five episode um, docudrama is the best way of putting it was very good in my view, very good indeed. It was very, um, although some uh, artistic license was, um, was used, um, the essence of it um, the, was basically true. The key message from the, the uh, TV um, docudrama was that, um, that the Soviet government lied and lied and lied and lied and still lying now. Um, so, I'd like to finish with this, that um, with what the US Spanish philosopher George Santayana said, is that governments who are unable to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Because that's what's happening now, I'm afraid, in Ukraine. Thanks for listening. And these are two good reports, which I would mention to you, um, particularly the, the development program report and the report um, from the United Nations Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Thank you very much. I'll try and take some questions. Thank, thank you, Ian. Uh, we, we have most of it in our library, but 
shall, oh, shall learn some more. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mary, would you please join the screen? I'm here. And uh, I guess I should share my screen. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, here we go. Huh. Didn't do that part. I'm sorry. I have to do it here first, share screen. It's All not right. a day for, technical, for technicalities, but we manage. Yes, we manage. Yes. <laughs> Okay, here we go from beginning. All right, can you see the slides? Yes. Very good. And I have my watch here and I want to thank Dr. Fairley for his presentation. He's a longtime friend of mine and I learn from him every time he speaks and assure him that the questions will be at the end. Um, there is some overlap in my presentation, but I want to tell you that citations can be found on my website, genderandradiation.org. And I believe uh, the notes pages from these slides may also be available um, on the center's website. So atomic radiation is more harmful to girls and women compared to boys and men. A number of independent analysts have found this pattern. I am one of them. Now, I want to mention that I have a dog and she's sleeping, and they say let sleeping dogs lie, but she is also snoring, for which I apologize if you hear it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to proceed, but just if you hear a noise, that's what it is. It's my dog snoring. This talk will focus on harm to people. However, all of life on our planet is impacted by radiation. Historically, regulation of radiation exposure is based only on males. It is assumed that the body being exposed to the radiation from an accidental release or from a licensed activity is a young adult male, a reference man. The definition for reference man also includes race, climate, lifestyle factors, as well as culture. These are all the factors that are considered in exposure of the public. In general, female bodies, as well as anyone with a traditional land-based local foods lifestyle have been invisible and so less protected by national safety regulations. The short film 1945 to 1998 by Azeo Hashimoto contains this image of the places on earth where nuclear weapons have been detonated up to 1998. It is not a fallout map. It shows relative numbers of nuclear explosions. There have been more than 2,000 and 528 of these were in our atmosphere. This map shows radioactive iodine, which Dr. Fairley also mentioned. This is uh, the exposed US population from atmospheric nuclear weapons tests that were conducted in Nevada at the Nevada test site from 1951 to 1962. Iodine was concentrated by the food chain and this map act shows actual levels of radiation exposure to children, primarily from drinking milk. Dark red is the highest levels and Iodine has a very short half-life of about eight days. And so in three months, as Dr. Fairley says, it's mostly gone from the environment, but not the impacts. You saw a different reconstructive map of uh, radiation levels. It, I'm sure there's pros and cons to any map, but this is the one that I use because it's very clear. The red is the highest levels of cesium that came from the Chernobyl explosion and graphite fire in 1986. It shows only the Eurasian continent, but in fact, the radioactivity also made it to North America. The radio radioactive decay of cesium-137 results in formation of stable barium-137. So now that 37 years have passed, given a 30-year half-life for cesium-137, a bit more than half of the radioactivity is now gone, 
And that is very good news. So one of the key issues that has not been resolved in talking about gendered findings in radiation, male versus female in the binary of male and female, is whether biological sex is a factor if you eat, drink, and breathe in the radioactivity. And that is really the story of both the fallout maps and the reactor accidents. And Chernobyl is not the only one we've had. They result in contaminated air, water, food, and that leads to contaminated bodies. And we have not yet had anyone answer the question of whether internal exposure has a difference between males and females. So that's the headline on this slide. We don't know and we need to know. And there's a few other qualifications on the findings I'm about to share fairly quickly. First is that it's based on external exposure only. So it doesn't include that question about contaminated food, water, and air. The results are from the first generation exposed only. Biological sex was assigned by the researchers, binary male versus female. A large population is what this data that I'm about to present to you comes from. It comes from over 100,000 individuals and a control population. And there was a research question, what are the long-term consequences of using nuclear weapons on civilian populations measured as cancer incidents and cancer deaths? And yet the findings are generalized far beyond that. I need to take just a moment and acknowledge that as a US citizen, my government chose to create nuclear weapons and then chose to use the first ones on unconscionable targets on cities full of people. As only one woman, I always express my deep sadness and, and apologize because it was wrong and worse, it is a war crime and has not been acknowledged as such. The decision to study the A-bomb survivors in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was by design. The researchers made no effort to treat the injured and sick survivors. It was thought that care would change the outcome of the experiment. Clearly, the study is also a war crime. The data from the A-bomb survivors is used widely. It is the underpinning for nearly every uh, international body's assumptions about radiation. And it's going to be used by me here today. I use the data because it is the only large data set that contains people of all ages and both sexes. The worker studies are important, but they're all adult and primarily male. And we do not want another data set. The information in these numbers is important to the survival of life on earth, but that does not absolve my sin for, for using it. I am so sorry we are here. And yet there is also so much more we need to know. So turning now to this slide, the 2006 report of the US National Academy of Sciences called Beer 7 for Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. It is very famous and it is a source of the data for my independent findings. I did not collect any data myself. Mm -hmm. The report provides the numbers, but no discussion of biological sex as a factor in degree of radiation harm. Dr. Arjun Makajani and his team published similar findings in 2006. My work was completely independent and provides a second look. The first photo was the city of Hiroshima and the second, the city of Nagasaki. So beginning with a little bit of basics, not every exposure of radiation results in harm. We have incredible repair mechanisms and not all radiation harm is cancer. Uh, Ian did a very good job of introducing, but I just wanna mention that since children are growing, the cells in their bodies are dividing more rapidly than adults. The DNA in cells that are growing are more likely to be damaged when in cell division. And Nonetheless, our bodies still can repair some of that damage. We cannot know which exposure to radiation will result in cancer, and we can rarely prove that a particular cancer was caused by radiation. 
Therefore, we have to study large populations and look for patterns. The news from the large population of survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that biological sex makes a big difference in the degree of radiation harm to individuals of all ages. The survivors were grouped by the age they were at the time of the bombing, August 1945. These groups were tracked over their lifetimes for 60 years in this presentation. Cancers and cancer deaths were counted. Both males and females were, who were five years or younger when exposed to A-bomb radiation had the most cancer at some point in their lives. The illnesses come across the 60 years. It is not all childhood cancer for those who were exposed as children. Girls in this group were twice as likely to get cancer at some point than were the same age boys. For every male in the birth to five cohort that suffered cancer in the study period, two females got cancer in the study period. A doubling of impact is significant. Just to state briefly that little girls are not a subpopulation as the US APA, EPA characterizes them. We are in an inextricable link in the human life cycle. Gender was also a factor for those who were adults at the time of the bombings. Over their lifetime, women exposed as adults suffered more cancer death than did men in the same age group. For every two men in these cohorts who died of cancer, three women died of cancer. This is the same information on a chart showing cancer incidents across the 60 years with a scenario based on the primary data. The scenario is what if everyone got the same level of radiation exposure? This is not what happened, but it can be adjusted in a large, large population. This case is a constant exposure of one gray, so we can look specifically at age and biological sex as factors in radiation outcome. The bottom shows the age the survivors were when they were exposed in 1945 to the one pulse of gamma and neutron radiation that is an external dose that they all shared, exposure that they all shared. The infants are grouped at the left and at the right are the elders. Blue is male, red is female. Each bar is 60 years of data and shows the rate of cancer per 100,000. The chart does not show the age of onset of the cancer. It is easy to see that females suffered more cancers than males in every age group, and the difference is greatest when the exposure was in young childhood. So I'm going to jump to the uh, end simply to say that there are so more, many more questions than answers in this finding. We need large institutions with good funding to give our rising generation of brilliant young students who should get PhDs and MDs earning uh, them by asking and answering these basic science questions. And with that, I will just point out that reference man was appropriate to the workers that he was derived from but nobody stopped to evaluate whether he was appropriate for the general population. And regulation based on reference man results in a systematic underreporting of radiation harm for the global population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you both Ian and Mary for putting the global context and very basic elements of what we're looking at and pointing us in a direction of doable further research. Um, Oksana, the floor and the screen are yours. Hello, everyone. And Vitaev всех на Ukraini. Slava uh, Ukraini. And I will uh, speak in English. Um, 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 I will speak um, to the my and um, families and friends, what I would say human experience of having survived Chernobyl accident. I'll also try to highlight 
a little bit of the generations of trauma that is common for Ukrainian families and um, give voice to uh, both children and uh, hopefully adults as I, through the lens that I experience in interviews um, I've carried out so far um, just informally with my family and friends. I did grow up through um, what I identify as Soviet occupation and rule and um, I was um, on Friday, April 26, 86, I was 13. Um, and I lived in the city of Kiev with uh, my sister who was then 11 and my, uh, my parents who were it, by Soviet, those of you who remember Soviet Union kind of low level engineers, uh, very working class intelligentsia level. And um, we lived in the working class part of the city of Kiev and I mapped it with Google maps and it's exactly 71 miles from the reactor that was destroyed making sense of what happened then, what happened in the history of my family and the generational layers of that historical trauma has been really lifelong work. And I I'm, uh, feel like I'm still in the middle of it, especially in light of current war. But my answer is just like many of those who lived in Ukraine and especially in that area of Northern um, Ukraine, were uh, many, I would say majority of us survivors of the Holodomor, the starvation and gulags, wars and Soviet political lists. And I want to honor um, many of my, my, my ancestors who were starved in the Holodomor and my great grandfather who was um, executed in Salovki Gulag. And so that land has suffered greatly and, um, and it continues to suffer. And there is a silence and trauma and often to me erasure. So I want to uh, share some of the recollections from those days. I uh, rechecked right before presentation, those of you know, one of the most, you know, kind of common books, award-winning Midnight in Chernobyl by Adam Higginbotham. And he has a half a page on what happened to uh, all the uh, children uh, in Kiev and Kiev area. Um, and I, I look for sometimes those and other times I can't watch or like HBO show, but I, I have so many gaps in my memory because a lot of those experiences were profoundly psychologically uh, very intense, difficult and anxiety provoking to all of us, but what I remember as a child. And so I don't remember a whole lot and have to fill my memory gaps by conversations with, say, my sister. But um, by then, Soviet Union was already in quite a hard place. Those of you who grew up through it, uh, maybe remember some of the pictures. But I recall standing in long food lines and uh, everything was quite uh, falling apart. But we were still told that we live in the best place in the, in the world and everything's under control. Mm -hmm. And so what I remember from those days of the accident, that those were first warm days of the season and they were coming up on a big holidays, May 1st holidays holidays, which I'm on the most um, active, largest in the Soviet Union. And so I recall being in parks. I remember being in forests, on picnics, playing outside. I remember very windy days. They were still um, uh, uh, bristly cold, but we just spent a lot of time in our first holiday season of warm days outside as, as kids and families. I, my sister recalls being made to go downtown for the Kiev parade. We usually watch them at home, uh, like the Thanksgiving parade, except the balloons in New York. We had, uh, you know, all the tanks and the nuclear mis missiles and the army marching. But I, um, we would have been dressed up and standing at the downtown parade. On the May 2nd, my sister recalls that we had, we were all kind of told and she had, um, all day outside chalk drawing event uh, for Soviet children. And so on May 2nd, we spent the day watching her chalk draw on outside. Um, and she, she remembers she got the second place uh, in, the, in the area. And so we just went along. I recall some news on TV. And there was occasionally, if I recall, mentioning of the accident, but routinely mentioning that there's nothing to worry about, everything's under control, everything's fine. So we're talking about a week. So what we were showing all the, as the nuclear um, um, you know, clouds blowing all around. 
And then very suddenly I recalled that we were told to stay, to, we, we weren't going to school, we were going to stay inside. And a small apartment was transformed. Our windows were taped shut several times over, carpets were pulled. Um, we were, um, I, you know, back then nobody knew what to do. The radiation was in the dust. You had to protect yourself from this invisible, scary dust. And so our hair was pulled back, covered by handkerchiefs. We washed it four or five times a day. We washed floors four or five times a day. And it was to say that it was terrifying is an understatement. Mm -hmm. um, I recall that um, we didn't know what was uh, safe to eat. And so we went through all the canned food that we already had in our small apartment. Um, my parents still had to go to work like all Soviet uh, workers. I recall still TV saying that everything's under control. Um, my parents would talk and, you know, just by then that elites have fled the town, elites took, you know, and all the Soviet elites were left and here we are and uh, trying to deal with this um, disaster. I recall no medication, no help no information of any kind. And then one day my sister and I were packed very suddenly taken to a train station, like all Kiev children and Kiev area children. And we were taken to pioneer camps, ours uh, as entire school. Ours was uh, near Mariupol, those of you. And uh, I sent my care, I have uh, friends uh, whose families just died in Mariupol. And, but we were in, near the area of Mariupol in the Soviet style pioneer camp. Pioneer camps were very common. You, I usually went to pioneer camp in the summer. It's about a month. It's assigned to your parents' work. And it's kind of a Soviet education camp slate slash Boy Scout, Girl Scout camp for a month. Um, and uh, the one I went to that's, uh, was in the city of Irpin near Kiev. Um, and it's a city who just where atrocities were committed. And I saw that the summer camps were used by Russians for torture sites. So, you know, there's that kind of history too. But in this camp and near Mariupol with my entire school, uh, again, there was, I recall, no treatment, no information, and we were uh, terrified. I have almost entire, some, some portions of it, I have no recollection of, of, of much of it. I do recall that we hardly got any mail. There were no phones we could use to call. And here us children spend about a hundred days, my sister remembers 96 days, away from our parents. And so what we, we thought about that uh, there was more accidents, that our parents died, that everybody knew died, that we were dying. Uh, we began to hear news that there were two headed animals being born near Chernobyl and therefore, um, in addition to being sick and dying, our children are going to be born two headed. Mm -hmm and so forth and so on. Again, I recall no medical help and no information, no, certainly no psychological information. What I want to highlight is some of the psychological cruelty of the Soviet state, because while we were at that camp, once a week we were shown what was supposed to be a children's film or children's cartoon. I do recall one such cartoon being shown to us. It was a cartoon of a Japanese anime horror film that was called Barefoot Gen. Mm -hmm. I encourage you all to look it up, Barefoot Gen or Basanogi Gen. Um, it was apparently shown all over Soviet Union and I've just found studies in Russia studying impact of psychological cruelty, Soviet cruelty on children there. And somewhere as far as Moscow, they were showing these films to kids, but they showed it to us at this camp after we survived. Chernobyl, and we were there by ourselves. And if you look at this film, it's an extremely graphic adult classified cartoon where there are images uh, where, first of all, Gan has his family. He watches them die in a bombing, and then there's radiation sickness. And it's shown very, very graphically, zombie-like bodies, uh, skin melting off, radiation, everybody's sick for radiation, and he tries to survive trying to help his mother who just gives birth to his little sister. And so uh, in addition to general Soviet cruelty to children who've been shown such films, what I think about these days is that what Russia and Russo Soviet did best, always pointing fingers elsewhere, always trying to say it's uh, someone else did worse things and having no care for any kind of psychological, psychological experiences of children. So I still, 
I I still occasionally have nightmares of the I, when I saw the images. I was like, that's what I have nightmares about the cartoon that was shown to us. When I returned, I also recall no help. I it took I was I became quite sick with kind of uh, what now would be very classic thyroid illness uh, condition within a year or two, and it took almost if I recall two years. I only got proper treatment in, in the ninety. Um, of um, 1990, so um, several years yet for my thyroid disorder. And so I spent my teenhood uh, with all kinds of thyroid conditions that were not diagnosed. I also just learned that there were efforts to help Soviet children. And there was a largest ever funded fund, NGO, uh, Children of Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. um, I asked everyone I know of my peers in Ukraine, and nobody knew of it. I certainly received no help from it. Apparently, they took almost all of the money went to Belarus. Mm -hmm. And even then, it went to Lukashenko. And so I think that this continuous Soviet history of the ways that children and Ukrainians have been treated. And I think as a survivor and those millions of Ukrainians facing Russian aggression, including not that Chernobyl and Zaporizhia um, nuclear threats, but nuclear threats every other week by the government of Russia. Mm. I, I think it is the kind of cruelty and psychological torture that has we've experienced and continues. And I think it's just another mark of pretty long, long history of inhumanity towards Ukrainians. So I want to um, add this and again to my Ukrainian uh, community, Slav Ukraini. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oksana. Oh, we are learning an awful lot, aren't we? Uh, and we will continue in another uh, medium too. Uh, dear Luba, please. Hey, everybody. First of all, I have to say, I'm I'm extremely moved by everybody's presentation from the two scientists, from what we heard from Oksana. I come here as a visual artist and I, I think I express myself the best with images. So let me just uh, share my screen and I'll be talking on the background. Um, um, Okay, so we we are in a full screen mode and uh, I hope you see the picture, right? Yeah. So this is an image called uh, Chernobyl Fukushima. And um, I was approached by a Ukrainian um, international exhibition who invited me to create uh, something to commemorate the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl, which coincided with the explosion amid the earthquake in Fukushima and then the radioactive uh, leak um, in Fukushima. And um, I, uh, I'm based in New York. I've lived and worked uh, here in, in my studio since 91, but I'm originally from Bulgaria. And um, I experienced something also related very much to what Oksana was just describing but I've never been to Ukraine and being a very busy artist here in New York, this um, um, invitation that I got from Ukraine made me think about uh, this terrible um, catastrophe that happened in Chernobyl and 25 years later, the humanity again, uh, becoming a victim of another radioactive um, um, pollution coming from Japan, from a very highly a developed industrial country, and yet you see something that happened back the, 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 in the primitive Soviet society, and now 25 years later happening in Japan. So, so this made me think about the vulnerability of man, and I was just trying to make an association with where the, the atom, the word atom came from. It was given to us by the ancient Greeks. So in my image, I, if you know from art history, the this beautiful sculpture of Lokon and his sons, um, I replaced the snakes that, that, that attacked this group of three men, one, the father and two sons, 
with the atomic model. And that gave me the message of the destruction of humanity and the vulnerability of, of man, no matter how technologically advanced uh, we are. But um, just a little background on the uh, person who invited me to, to create this piece. His name is Oleg Veklenko, and he's a well-known Ukrainian artist. And when the Chernobyl explosion happened, he was one of these uh, cleanup uh, workers, but actually they were not workers, they were the soldiers. Uh, there was a mandatory draft in, in uh, communist uh, Soviet Union and he was a soldier and their entire uh, um, group or brigade or how they call it, they were thrown in the steaming hot uh, radioactive um, place. And that, that was the fourth block of this uh, huge atomic plant. So they were thrown and uh, they worked nonstop in, without any protection. And very soon uh, after they completed some work, uh, maybe in a couple of months, he said that almost all of them, all of these young men died. Only him and one other um, friend of his survived. And then some years later, he founded this international exhibition, which is a very well-known uh, biennial in Ukraine. And they approached me and asked me to participate. And uh, this exhibition uh, they called the fourth block, which is this fourth block of the um, this um, Chernobyl nuclear plant that exploded. But talking also about what we heard from Oksana and what I experienced uh, when I was still in Bulgaria, because I'm originally from Bulgaria and I relocated to the United States um, in 91. But I was a young uh, person then. And uh, as Professor Fairley showed the map of everyday uh, contamination, the way it um, originated from Ukraine and this uh, stream of uh, radioactive air uh, flew over Europe. I saw that on the fourth day, this uh, dark uh, radioactive uh, cloud uh, covered Bulgaria. And that was, I remember, a beautiful spring day. I was at my parents' um, <clears throat> apartment, which was on, on the 10th floor of a condominium building. And I saw uh, rain coming and started to rain and I went on the balcony and I stretched my arm and I saw black drops like black ink uh, covering my arm. And I went inside and I showed it to my mom and my mother was a chemist. She immediately figured out what was going on despite that we lived in a time of censorship like Oksana said. Absolutely nothing was told to, to people. So my mother dragged me to the bathroom and said, immediately wash and scrub, take off your clothes. She closed the windows. And what Oksana was describing, describing we also lived it. My mother stopped buying any uh, fruits and vegetables or vegetables. Everything was washed. Everything was um, thrown away, what uh, we bring inside the home, you know. So. And at the same time, a censorship, which I have to also mention, kind of reminds me of the censorship we witnessed during COVID because this terrible um, virus came from China, which is the equivalent of Soviet Union for the West. And see, we never got to the bottom of it. So the same censorship exists, unfortunately, still in our lives. Now, what we are facing in Ukraine, um, is this terrible war and again kind of link uh, the link is with the fate of these um, soldiers in Ukraine that were thrown to do the, the first responders cleanup job. How many of these people died or how many were you know being killed now in Ukraine in this terrible war? So what is the price of peace that we pay? And this is a temporary prosthetic leg that I transform into a cage and inside is the symbol of uh, peace. In my work as an artist, I'm truly interested in these social issues that we face. I think contemporary museums or galleries bombard us with all kinds of provocative uh, imagery, but in a very superficial level of provocation. 
are very often they're so distant and abstract that people do not feel really connection with, with contemporary visual arts that is displayed in, in many of our living museums. So in my work, I try to address these issues and I'm happy to say I'm a busy artist exhibiting all the time. The first one was the duality of war and peace and how instead of dialogues, we create um, wars and, and nuclear um, explosions and killing innocent people. This was done uh, for an event here in New York um, that was um, organized by an organization called the American Friends Service Committee, which is a Nobel Prize winning organization during World War II. And uh, um, people gathered um, in um, downtown uh, in, at Union Square and marched to United Nations. Even the mayor of Hiroshima was at that event. But the first introduction by Professor Tabachnikov, he was mentioning how this uh, uh, war and uh, nuclear pollution um, damages the, the plants and the environment. So this is the message of this one. And here again, the message of the funds we spent on war, education versus war, how much millions and billions of dollars are being spent on these um, wars instead of uh, devoting them to education and then um, link to, to Oksana's comments and to all, everything we hear about Ukraine now, all these people that are being misplaced and forced to become immigrants and to grow, uh, being grafted in a new place and, and having to grow somewhere else. So all of this is reflected in my work. This is an exhibition that I did a couple of years ago and it's still traveling. Um, Dr. Daniele mentioned in her in introduction was shown recently in a big museum in Cincinnati, Ohio. As an artist, that's what I do. I use my tools to, to say something. So here's, here are a couple of views of this exhibit. Back to something which we face now when we faced, when I was a young kid also in, um, in Bulgaria and I witnessed this inequality even in this aftermath of Chernobyl, I would say, because I had um, a young girl friend whose father was a doctor in a hospital that served the elite of the Communist Party. And one day she said, why don't you come for lunch at our house? We, and my dad is bringing food from the hospital. And I said, wait a minute, I don't like food from the hospital. She said, no, but come because this is clean uh, food from the government reserve, which is not contaminated. And I went there and they served something. And, and I said to her dad, but is it really so? Because they are saying that the food we buy from the store, the milk and the cheese, that, that they're okay. And he said, no, it is contaminated and you're welcome to eat with us every time I bring food every day. So, you know, the inequality, you know, someone uses the reserve from back then from, from the entire government and the little forks had to share something completely different. But in our world today, we, we see exactly the same. So health coverage, again, Oksana was mentioning what happened in Ukraine to them. Nobody told them anything. And the umbrella that's supposed to protect you, the, the canopy is gone. But the same is true, unfortunately, in our world now. So many people don't have adequate health care. So privacy how the government controls our emails, our thoughts. So reference to Rodin and his thinker, corporate corruption. So these are just images that are linked in a way that are inspired by, by life. And here is one called water. And um, it's a commentary on climate change, but I would say not so much climate change, but rather the fate of humanity and how we need to think of what we are living for with these wars that devastate whole regions of the world. And uh, are we gonna be this crying baby when there is no one to help us one day? And this is one of image that I did. I also contribute quite often to the New York Times. So this was then as a visual commentary some long time ago when in the US there was the debate of whether 
um, the US will get involved in, a, in the Balkan uh, conflict. And, and Professor Fairley showed this part of the Balkan Peninsula that did not provide data for uh, radiation. And it's really because they were fighting back then. Bulgaria was not part of this uh, conflict, but for some reason, maybe the communist regime did not allow for, for these um, researchers to, to measure the level of radiation. But this was done when, and it was published in the New York Times on the editorial page, uh, when they were debating, how are we going to protect peace by creating more wars? And that was my visual reaction. It's been exhibited and um, a lover. And even here, one great organization in, um, in Manhattan called the War Resistors League, they put it like a big banner on their building and at uh, dusk, this banner would fall down and would be lit with the light from the, the, the structure. Um, so, what, well, I'm showing all this and, and like I said, I'm extremely moved by everything I've heard so far. Sometimes I'm really doubtful when art is really capable of changing anything, but that's the only thing I can do. And I try to, to be, what I do to be easy to access by people without reading any words, to just make them think, make them act and, and, and keep people hopeful that in the end, we'll be able to achieve the justice that we all want, no matter where we live or how many generations before us have fought for the same things, but now is our time to speak out and to do the right thing. So, so yeah, that's my presentation and thank you. Uh, I will stop sharing here. I will stop sharing. Do I still share the screen or no? I do? It's yeah. done. It's done, okay, great. Yeah, so, so that's for me. And thank you, thank you, Elle, for, Elle just found my work online and called me and here I am. So um, did I? How can I stop sharing? That picture came again. Oh. I called her and within a minute, I heard the story about the black rain. Yeah, you heard it. But I lost you. Do you hear and see me? Because I lost the screen. I don't know what happened. I no, it's happen. fine. You just yeah. fine. It's OK. OK. OK, great. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we met, and we meet again. And, uh, Wonderful, thank you so much. I don't know where Ian is, but uh, uh, now is the time for the dialogue among you. I'm sure you can all unmute. Uh, Ian, can you join us, please? Oh. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I was wondering, uh, you, you already spontaneously responded somewhat to each other's um, yeah, sure. I had to go. I had to, um, huh? I had to go feed the cat. She was demanding to be fed. I apologize for my absence. I had to go feed the cat. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. As long as you're here now, uh, <laughs> and I wonder if your reactions to each other's teachings and findings. Oh, I'll chime in and say, Luba, I am in awe of your great wisdom and ability to formulate message. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just add that it was a moment of what I can only call, um, you know, not claiming full enlightenment, but a moment, uh, just a brief moment of enlightenment when I first was invited to present on these findings that I needed to create the silhouette images that you see. And I didn't do them, I commissioned them, but the power of image to convey information was absolutely a necessity because I had five minutes before the entire UN delegations at the Vienna Conference on Humanitarian Impacts of Nuclear Weapons to, to present these findings. I was teaching the first five minutes and the second five minutes I was asked to, to convey this. 
And that's when I realized I had to have images. So I can congratulate you on your work and will simply say that the fact that I did that created almost a little cartoon book that the diplomats could take around and they didn't need to have um, high level English or high level math to get the point. And I think our community sometimes needs to show up as you know, highly refined experts and other times it's so incredibly valuable to have your way of just cutting through to a single frame. So thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Um, I can say that uh, I also being somebody for whom image is something that I do every day um, and for me it's something natural, but I, um, I very much enjoyed both of your presentation and um, Professor Jan Fairley. Uh, because, like Oksana mentioned, I've never heard about any statistics back then coming from, from Eastern Europe when this was still very fresh. And then coming to New York, you try to forget and you just get so busy. I, I, I personally got busy from the first moment I, I came here. So um, this is very interesting that years after that, there is now a clear view from a distance of time of what really happened and that this radiation still is there. And now look, instead of Ukraine, after so many years, instead of taking the path of uh, developing of a new society and, and just uh, being part of Europe and, and the, the, you know, the, the international community, now there comes this primitive power that brings them back to, to below where they were. You know, this is just, just incredible and it's so important for scientists like you to speak out and absolutely if art can contribute to your message to be heard by many more people we have to do it together you know um so yeah thank you for both of you scientists who shared your findings in your research it's, it's really amazing for me yeah. Yeah. thank I, you that's exactly what the center is exists for so to, to put everybody together. So. Mm -hmm. Oksana? Um, I was going to, to say, I both so deeply appreciate and want to know, and I don't want to know. So like Ian and Mary, I, I don't know if it makes sense that I Perfect. think of my body, my female body, my children now, and uh, I occasionally run into articles that say, oh, genetic changes, da, 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 da. And, and it's very difficult in one's body to know to hold it's kind of like in being an experiment but also being a silence experiment because there's very little often attention or information my medical chart says i'm chernobyl survivor here in the us but that you know what does it mean are there studies and and i'm ian to your point i'm i'm, I'm wondering as a psychologist and i've done studies on you know traffic and immigration but i i think uh, just it's in um I, I don't know if I was ready, but I, I feel like it for present presentation for in presentation for this, I'm wondering about studying both Ukrainians and diaspora people who have lived through and looking at longer term generational impact of psychological sequelae to to having survived and what would that mean? So I, I'm I'm maybe others would too, but uh, that's that's what comes to mind. Again. Uh, it, our Ukrainian colleagues and Oksana is on our working group on Ukraine that I mentioned before. I know Irina, who is the co-chair of it, is in the audience. We are waiting for her involvement. Um, we are planning a, actually the center is using uh, the Daniele Inventory for Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, uh, which for a worldwide study, Mary knows about it very well, uh, a worldwide study of children of people exposed to any nuclear radiation or fallout, uh, both in originally Hiroshima and Nagasaki and across the world and we are it, we're very close to to finishing the the ukrainian version uh, so we are going to study systematically 
the mental, the psychosocial effects, and not only in terms of psychiatric diagnoses, but as I said at the beginning, how do people live history? How history is lived by the generations? So I'm so energized <laughs> by by Ian's and Mary's uh, uh, contributions, and of course, Oksana in Luba, and, and of course, Professor Shabatnikov is part of our connections in Ukraine. So, uh, you know, Luba, your image of the pencil reminds me of uh, one of my closest friends who was a journalist in the Balkans, uh, in all of Eastern Europe, but in the Balkans in particular, uh, who we lost in Iraq. She was a, a combat journalist. And um, she used to come to places and whenever she'd see children, she used to carry a whole lot of pencils and say, communicate, that fight with this, night with the weapons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and of course it has to do with the will to know and not to know, Oksana, that, that you're talking about. Uh, actually, this is one of my articles, Confronting the Unimaginable, right? How professionals are afraid to know, uh, which was a, a presentation I gave last Friday to Ukrainians colleagues. Um, May I chime in to respond to Oksana? This is a time for our dialogue, but just to say that Luba, I, I'm sure that you're inspired for an image by Mary's presentation, no? Yes, yes. <laughs> I thought immediately when I saw the silhouettes of the babies and the, the silhouette of this generic male uh, body, yes. um, I thought about that, but yeah, you, you know that an image is sometimes speaks stronger than words, so definitely science should bring. This is the science we need to learn. And I, and like I said, why not have the same about COVID? We need exactly the same type of research uh, because I mean that's happening out in our lives now. Why we don't talk about that openly? So um, yeah, definitely art. Art should not be, in my opinion, be held in uh, secluded galleries and museums. It should be brought to people to really not only appreciate the beauty of it, but just to engage them, to, to make them talk to one another, you know? So that's the art I'm interested in doing, you know? So, but definitely hand in hand with what's happening in real life, uh, not just uh, in some, existential, I mean, not existential, but kind of distant way of the so-called high and lofty culture. Culture is supposed to be part of life and address the issues of real life. And that doesn't make it a lower form of art. That's exactly what art is supposed to be, to be connected with life. So yeah, that's, that's how I see it, yeah. So I would like to speak to Oksana's um, sharing for a moment, if uh -huh. that's okay. Oksana, the, the truth of the matter is that the difference is our awareness. There isn't anyone in industrial society who could exempt themselves from a mortal risk of their own exposure or an intergenerational risk of harm to their their own um, primary germline, we call it, the eggs and the sperm that a male or female body carries um, without their knowledge. There isn't anyone in, in what I would call industrial society who doesn't have that risk. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they all have it, mm -hmm. but, but they have the risk of a hazard that has affected them and they don't know it. So the biggest difference about your medical chart 
and your experience is your knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I share that. I had a lab accident when I was a young woman doing research for pay. It was not my own project. I was working in a medical school in a laboratory for pay, and I got contaminated with radioactivity. And so I, too, have a knowledge of something that was much higher levels than many other labs. And so it has been acknowledged by a number of people as having that same, not as same as you, not same as anyone else, but a similar situation of knowing that something happened to me that could uh, produce long-term outcomes and even intergenerational outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the only thing I can say is that I don't do my job and my career and my passion um, except for the fact that if I don't do it, I suffer more. Mm -hmm. So it's not strictly driven by some need to um, <sighs> produce a result for anyone else. But the knowledge has enabled me to take a larger role than I might have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think for you also, maybe it fuels a certain amount of your focus and your commitment. Mm -hmm. And so that's the amazing thing about knowledge is it can hurt us and it can also build us and strengthen us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I very much agree, Mary. And uh, I think... Um, in addition to it, I think I want to, um, as more knowledge comes out around psychological experiences and stories, that's the other level of, right, of the truth telling and knowing that can fuel people and help people um, bring this. That's also was quite, quite silenced and not discussed. And so that's the piece too that I'm right thinking on kind of both levels. But, but I, I so appreciate your work and I, um, um do, do feel by everyone's just kind of uh commitment to to give voice and to know and to you know to address rather than to to set aside yeah indeed acknowledgement and um justice is mm -hmm. required for healing mm -hmm. someone just reminded me of that uh yesterday in a different context but i think it applies here as well thank you and uh of course, all of the publications you've mentioned are in the library of the center. And thank you both Mary and Ian for referring to other publications and putting them in the chat. Uh, so you answered to some of the questions from the audience. And um, the more we know, uh, the better. But of course, part of it is has to do with when we know it and how we know it. And uh, there, there are effects. So not only did Oksana speak about how the knowledge of Hiroshima Nagasaki was terrifying to a child, but we also learned in our work with our nuclear um, <clears throat> working group that in Japan, school children after Hiroshima, when I'm looking at for the book, but I have like 200 books right in front of me, so I won't find it. But they were given this very popularized book of a little girl who, who that was dying and while she was in the hospital she was making cranes if anybody in the audience can remember it i i know that because i have yeah. a picture of her she was making these uh, origami cranes and yeah, that exactly yes. Yes. Now, yeah. we have the book in the library i'm just i'm I'll so sorry my portrait. i did a portrait of her years ago i'll show it to you yeah yeah but we, we've learned from one of our uh, experts <clears throat> that when she was a little girl, she, she was made to read this book and, and age, you know, at first grade in school. And the children were terrified, right? Because she was idealized except 
people who made them read this forgot that that meant to the children that they're going to die. And indeed, uh, we will move spontaneously to the next amazing phase of, of uh, sharing with the audience and asking the audience for their own uh, contributions. And indeed, uh, there is an acknowledgement here that, uh, that there is always a struggle in Japan about how to teach children about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the same with the realization that you mentioned about the film that you were made to watch, right, Barefoot Jen. Uh, and, 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 and it's quite extraordinary that <clears throat> on the one hand, we are speaking about dictatorships, misinformation, disinformation, the use of silence to, 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 and, and, and to not know, to make sure people don't know. On the other hand, as Mary said, the only way to do it is with knowledge. <laughs> We, the policy makers would not make the correct decision if so they don't have the knowledge. Uh, teachers, it, it really affects every layer and dimension of living. And indeed, because of that story about the book, um, on, on August 9th, our nuclear uh, uh, working group, uh, our working group on nuclear issues, uh, with the focus on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we are going to have a webinar on education, precisely on this, how not to educate and how to educate. And I hope all of you would be there too, because uh, Ian, I saw you agreeing. What is your experience with teaching? You, you have teaching this because you have been teaching on all levels, as, as you mentioned. What is your experience? Um, since you ask, uh, yeah. Um, my experience is that most people are um, uh, confused and slightly frightened by radiation. And it's all I can say is, is my, I try hard to reassure people, um, in other words, to make, to impart knowledge to them, but um, not in a worrying way. Um, um, just to give an example, um, um, I try to explain to people that um, being exposed to radiation is rather like cigarette smoking. Of course, one is um, uh, voluntary, the other one is involuntary, but um, basically it's a, it's a matter of probabilities. In other words, the more that you smoke, the more likely you're going to get lung cancer. And similarly with radiation, the more that you are exposed to radiation, the higher your chances of, of um, of, of getting a cancer or a cardiovascular disease now, or thyroid cancer or whatever it may be. Um, in other words, if you, as an individual, limit your exposures to radiation um, severely, um, then really you not a lot to worry about. Well, what about past exposures? Well, um, the best way I can put it to you is that um, the longer you live, the, the less likely it is you're going to get cancer, <laughs> um, which is um, a nice thing. Um, however, I want to, now that I've got the floor, so to speak, I want to say one or two things. Firstly, to Oksana, that I was very moved by your description. Um, I feel very sorry for you. I really do of the experiences you went through. I've visited uh, Kiev a number of times now, um, be obviously before the war, and it was a beautiful city, um, an amazing city in many ways. 
Um, and um, I just hope that um, Ukraine um, gets through this war against um, uh, Putin and is successful. And I, I have every confidence that that will be the case. And I will finish by saying this, that um, I always look for a silver lining. And um, um, here in Britain and in Europe and in Ireland, there are groups called the Chernobyl Children's Projects who um, take um, children from Belarus and Ukraine um, into their homes for a period of a month, six weeks, sometimes two months, to give them a holiday away from radioactivity in their areas. And I've, these are great people, there are thousands of them, um, in Canada too, I think. I'm not sure about the United States, um, um, but it's, um, the thing about it is that it's a silent rebuke to all these official bodies like IAEA and WHO and UNSCARE who continue to hold the line that there's nothing to worry about at Chernobyl and that um, there, were only, there was only thyroid cancers, nothing else, which of course is absolutely untrue. Um, but the, the positive actions of the people who um, of, uh, belong to Chernobyl children's projects throughout the world um, is the best way of uh, saying to these official organizations, um, we don't believe you and we're doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, There is a question from the from Ace Hoffman. Uh, as someone said, all art is political. So thank you. That's to you, Luba. Um, but he's asking a question. Holtec International just announced that they will cooperate with Ukraine's nuclear power company to build small modular reactors. How do the scientists in the panel feel about that? That's for you, Mary and Ian. It's absolutely shocking. It really is. I mean, what does one say? Um, I throw up one's hands in horror. Um, I, it, it's difficult to answer that, really, um, without a, a touch of anger entering into my voice. Um, I, I know that Ukraine is... Um, uh, desperately short of electricity generation, but to go down the nuclear line is after what they've been through. Well, the beggar's belief, really, it does. And uh, Mary, what do you, what do you think? Well, splitting atoms is not a natural occurrence. There's been traces of it in some uranium deposits that the pro-nuclear people love to point to, but human beings started splitting atoms in 1942 in Chicago, and it was a choice. And it's always a choice. And we have better alternatives for both security and for energy that do not create millions of times more radioactivity and radiation and exposure uh, to the radiation, to workers, to the general public, creation of waste that we have absolutely no idea how to isolate for as long as they will be hazardous. And this is equally true of a small modular reactor cluster as it is of a single larger reactor. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. And my answer categorically these days is that fission must stop. It was a choice made by a bunch of, excuse me, but the fact is men and we women who have been raising the safety and health issues for a long time and been told in my own generation, in my own environmental community, that the only thing that matters is budget and money, we've got to just plain cut that off because it's not an adequate answer. The adequate answer is if we want to survive as a species, we have to start taking protection of our bodies and our children's bodies seriously. 
And there is no serious protection from somebody who is talking about new nuclear reactors. The only thing that is serious is to start phasing out fission and get it done and then live with the consequences we've already crea created in the waste as best we can. But there is no justification for further fission being developed, period. And the threats that are happening right now for the use of nuclear weapons are unconscionable. I am a full supporter of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which makes not only the making of nuclear weapons or the holding of nuclear weapons, but also the threat of use of nuclear weapons illegal on planet Earth in force in 68 nations today. And we have an obligation to increase that number, universalize that treaty, and be done with it. There's this shouldn't even be a question. Hello. Done with it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> you can see scientists can scientists can be passionate. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Ian, there is a question for you. Uh, I, I'm quoting Tom McLean. You said that parts of Europe will remain contaminated for hundreds of years. Pro-nuclear power advocates say that the effects of radioactive contaminations is often overstated. For example, quote, a banana is more radioactive. Quote, what health concerns does the level of contamination in Europe cause? If someone moves into this contaminated area, would they notice? Would they be likely to live a long, healthy life? Ian, well, I've, I've written a reply to that, but uh, I'll, I'll say it again. Tom, thanks for your question, but um, it's really difficult to generalize, very difficult to generalize. It very much depends on who's going and where they're going to and how long they're going to stay there, okay? In my slides, which I hope that um, Dr. Daniele will uh, circulate if people want, I, there, uh, there's a map of Europe and in the highly contaminated areas, in other words, the areas which are red or brown, and um, then it's serious. It's going to be contaminated and be a, a real danger to people living in those areas for the next couple of hundred years. Um, and um, so, um, however, and areas which are only very lightly contaminated, in other words, white or light yellow, then the, the problem is much less serious. So it's a bit of a generalized answer. Um, and um, this nonsense about bananas, I mean, <laughs> it drives me bananas <laughs> every time I hear it. Um, I can, trying to, the nuclear protagonists always drag this out about uh, bananas containing potassium-40. Well, so what? Um, a lot of our food contains potassium-40 um, and extremely uh, low levels. That doesn't mean that we build nuclear power stations or, uh, around the world for heaven's sakes. It's just a non sequitur. Basically, there, it's true that the background radiation does exist. Um, roughly speaking about, on average, about three to four millisieverts a year. Um, that doesn't mean, therefore, that uh, radiation is safe. It doesn't. I mean, um, there are hazards from um, background radiation. And, and uh, we can learn about that. But uh, to say from jump from there to saying, oh yeah, we need to have more nuclear power stations is that's crazy uh, non sequitur, to be honest. Naturally occurring radiation produces naturally occurring cancer. It also produces a certain amount of impact on reproduction. Adding to it has, has been our foolhardy errand of the 20th century and there's no justification for increasing those risks whatsoever. And I'm going to take just a moment to do a little number disclosure because most people haven't heard that in the United States, we have regulators who license fission at reactor sites and waste disposal sites and everything else are called the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and their own risk estimate. I am not endorsing, I'm simply disclosing that they 
believe that if you have a whole population of reference men, only reference men, the cancer rate, cancer death rate from natural background levels would be one in 286 from, from exposure to radiation. Whereas over in the toxic side in EPA, we talk about a risk of one in 10,000 being the highest risk that will be tolerated versus one in 100,000 being the goal for toxic exposure. Whereas over on the radiation side, we have regulators who don't tell you this, but they start at one in 286. And that's the reference man. So just imagine what it would look like if we had a reference little girl. And Sayo Wen Lo uh, says from Taiwan, as someone who came from Taiwan, this presentation filled me with all sorts of emotions. I can't help by feeling anger towards Russians for what they are doing and how China is eyeing Taiwan while the US is trying what they can do to prevent another invasion. It struck me when Dr. Olson apologized for what her government did to Japan during World War II. Taiwan was colonized by Japan at the time, and Japan had been in war with China for eight years and wasn't going to stop the war crimes until the nuclear bomb. So as much as I empathize with the Fukushima residents, I am also grateful for the US. I don't know how long the war would have gone on had the US not intervened. Sitting with Dr. Yakushko's stories and Luba's work, this is such a complex psychological space to be. Thanks to the organizers, thank you, and the panelists, and all the attendees for showing up for this needed webinar. I pray and work for ongoing healing for all. Amen, thank you. Uh, and Anne Pat Sanchez says, how can we spread your powerful facts so we can stop the drive for even more nuclear reactors? Uh, and, and everyone in the audience, the center will have a recording of this webinar and shared every item that was shared uh, forever. And actually we have other webinars that we had on are the angles of looking at nu the nuclear issues, including even a webinar of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki second generation with United States uh, second generation speaking with each other, which is a very, please, look at our website, you'll find an awful lot to work with. And part of the answer is, because you will have access to the recording, please spread it anywhere. So people do learn and do understand the danger. And William Collins says, Illinois is about to pass a bill allowing construction of nuclear reactors again. Please call and write the governor, state senators, state representatives, and tell them your position to it, please. Thank you, Bill. And Norma, thank you all for this important discussion. My question has to do with how to situate psychological harm, stress with respect to physical illness. <laughs> what a simple question. Stress has long been used as an authoritative interpretation in lieu of physical illness. In Japan, with UN support, stress as factor is mobilized to deny physical illness rather than to see both interwoven as causes of ongoing suffering. How can we contest this tendency to go from either or to both and? Just like Mary said, we keep teaching, we keep teaching, we create, we establish facts and we talk and teach everywhere we can. This is why we hold this particular webinar. This is why this center exists. 
Thank you for asking. Yes, it goes both ways. Uh, actually, Norma, part of the reason our international study, our worldwide study, is not getting as many as I expected to uh, reaction, uh, responding, uh, sorry, responding subjects is because they can talk forever about the physical. I have this cancer, I have that cancer, my brother has this cancer, my mother had that cancer, but not about mental health. So the resistance works, the resistance works in every which way. And we simply must teach and teach and teach. Now, Linda Walker says to Mary, it was fascinating, Mary, to see the map of how much of the US was affected by iodine-131 from testing. Do you think this is why the US took so long to acknowledge the levels of thyroid cancer in Belarus and Ukraine and put so much effort into the research in the hope that they might find another course? They have not helped with research into leukemia, any other cancer, or any other health effects of Chernobyl. Mary or Ian, do you have any comment on that? Ian? You're muted. I'm not a student of um, the situation of the United States, I'm afraid. Um, it, uh, you okay, remember? Go ahead. No, 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 I'm just trying to think. Um, I don't really know why um, uh, the United States government didn't say anything at all about the um, thyroid epidemics in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, it's difficult to say. Perhaps Mary's got more to contribute to this because uh, being in America, um, she was there at the time. I, I do not have a knowledge of the history of subsidy or non-subsidy of US participation in the aftermath of Chernobyl. I was... Um, personally affected by it, but my work at that time um, was not focused on it. So I don't have the blow by blows and I don't discount what the question says. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that the United States is where fission began. Yes, there is this story of how many different um, Entities around the planet were racing to discover how to do the E equals MC squared equation correctly and release all that energy and heat and weaponize it. And the United States is where that got done. As a result, it has the largest workforces in the world that are exposed regularly to ionizing radiation. And there are various ways in which the liability associated with that has been sort of handled in the United States, but certainly not well handled. I mean, it should be the reason for um, nationalized medical care in the United States um, as at least an option for people because uh, the fallout was so extensive. Um, and clearly that has not happened. And clearly, why am I as an <laughs> underfunded, <laughs> uncredentialed woman, the one carrying the news about disproportion of impact of radiation on half the world's population? I mean, come on, guys. They are not disclosing this stuff very well. So uh, why did they not disclose or help or support in Ukraine? They don't help support or disclose anywhere. <laughs> um. I totally agree with what uh, Mary yes. has said. Yes, Sorry. there's so much more that we don't know than what <laughs> than we do know. And, and it's not an accident. I am so sorry, but I'm going to have to leave directly at three. Well, uh... So did you answer yourself to all the questions asked of you at the at the chat? Because I see that you do. You no, it's uh, random. <laughs> oh, it's random. Well, 
Uh, it, then we will have to send you whatever after three and you'll do it later. But um, I wanted to, uh, there is um, just a moment. Mary Beth Brangman, Brangan uh, speaks, uh, mentions the hormonal disruptions as a possibility. Did you see her questions? I did, but I did write a little bit of a reply, and I'm now going to ask Ian if he wants to speak to that. And I apologize to those who've been asking questions in the chat. I am a poor chat responder. I yes, welcome that, that, anyone to I, email me, and I did put my email address into the chat. Everyone is welcome to email me. Yeah, but then please make sure it, they're copied to the center so that we don't lose scope of what needed to, needs to keep being said. Okay, or, or you send me stuff and then you'll put it back out, however you want to do it. Exactly. It's all good. All good. Uh, uh, and Mary Beth says to you, Ian, you're totally justified to have anger in your voice in response to the Ukrainian and Japanese nuclear plants. Uh, I see Ira Irina, our Irina, beloved Irina is here. Our, our chair of working group on Ukraine. Uh, Irina, I know you have a question to Mary. Oh, she left already? Yeah, oh, come it's, on. It's so, time to finish. So ask Ian. So ask Ian. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank you, Yael, for organizing this very important event and all the presenters. Uh, to Dr. Fairley, to Dr. Yakushko, to Ms. Lubova, uh, Luba Lukova. And um, I'm here, uh, like not accidentally, because uh, officially I'm not a child of uh, Chernobyl. I have no, you know, uh, kind of confirmation. However, like all the children has. But uh, my mother was pregnant uh, during this time, and this year I will, yeah, have my thirty seventh, um, um, yeah, uh, birthday. So maybe that's the reason, like, why children that were not yet born were not um, acknowledged as, as children of Chernobyl. However, uh, I believe that the effect on the warmth was, uh, yeah, I hope that there there are studies reflecting the impact of radiation to, to pregnant women. Um, and luckily uh, the, the, the pregnancy was like on second trimester. That's why my mother was not recommended to make an abortion when the, the women who were pregnant on the first trimesters, they were seriously recommended by, the, by their uh, medical doctors to make an abortion because nobody knew what to expect. Um, yeah, what would be the impact? So, uh, Dr. Fairley, if you have any uh, uh, data on that or research done on that. Uh, well, uh, I don't have any data on that. Um, um, we do know that um, radiation is a teratogenic agent, in other words, that people who are pregnant, who are exposed to radiation during their pregnancy, um, do suffer consequences. Um, it depends entirely on what the level of exposure is. And, um, and I really hesitate about generalizing. Um, the, the thing is that you are living arena and you are evidence of the fact that your mum probably wasn't exposed to high levels of radiation, okay? So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was the same as uh, Oksana because my mother stayed in Kiev as well. And like, uh, yeah, so uh, who knows how it, how it works uh, basically, but children were sent by the government somewhere, but like pregnant women, they had no recommendation or so. It was just intention to leave the area. Right, right. I'd like to make a general comment here, and that is I'm looking at the chats and there's a lot of um, requests for help here and help there and other questions. Um, to the Canadians who are listening in, um, 
I very much hope that you are linked up with or get the newsletters from an outfit called the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, OCAA. They're an excellent group of people. And, um, and if you're not on their mailing list, A, you should be, uh, point one. For Americans um, south of the border, um, I very much hope that you are on the mailing list of Beyond Nuclear or Beyond Nuclear International for a country, people outside of the United States. Uh, Beyond Nuclear is a, a great bunch of people, um, very well informed, and um, you should be on their mailing list. And because they're the people that you should be going to for help on this. Um, they've been fighting against um, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons for oh, the last 20, 30 years, and ditto with OCAA in Canada. Um, so please join your local organizations, okay? Oh, and I would say also that um, there's an, a number of um, questioners have talked about the Manhattan Project. I have to say that I've noticed in my trips to the United States that the Manhattan Project is viewed, generally speaking, certainly by the media and by the government, as being a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing. Basically, the nuclear power stations that, that are, exist in the United States are the extension of the Manhattan Project. And the fact that they're more being planned is yet an, an ex, um, evidence that the Manhattan Project is alive, well, and kicking. And essentially, I hope you were gathered from Mary that and she took personal res uh, responsibility for it as an American. I think more people have to do that. Here in Britain, I belong, uh, in fact, I'm vice president of an organization called Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, pressing for an end to nuclear weapons in Britain. And I feel um, slightly guilty about the fact that Britain um, is uh, co-signatory along with the United States and Canada to develop more nuclear weapons, which is crazy. So I hope that people will um, realize that it's, um, nuclear power is inextricably linked with nuclear weapons and that we should be opposing both of them. If you think that you can have weapons without nuclear power stations, no, you can't. All of the fissile material used in nuclear weapons comes from nuclear power stations or nuclear facilities. So you can't have one without the other, you have to oppose both. And they both come from the Manhattan Project. Now, if I have your permission, you know, I'd like to say, explain something to you for, uh, this will take about a minute and a half. Do you mind? Not, uh, of course not, but uh, let me just ask you, several of the, our Canadian people from Canada in the audience uh, didn't hear what you said. The name of the Canadian organization you recommended, would you no, say okay. it again okay. or please yeah, point it to them? I'll say it again. It's the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, O-C-A-A, -A. okay? Look, Google it, you'll get it, okay? Now, if, if I may return to what I wanted to say about the Manhattan yes, Project. Yes, please, please. Many people take the view that the, the dropping of the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the creation of the bombs and the dropping them was, was necessary to end World War II. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that is yet another nuclear lie. It's not true. The ending of the Second World War was in fact more due to the two land battles that took place in June and July of 1945 in Manchuria, mm -hmm. where the Chinese army, the Japanese army, sorry, were um, completely beaten, slaughtered by the Soviet forces. And this was a terrible blow to Japan. 
in other words, they they are they are they are a very martial culture and um, coming from the samurai, um, and they um, when their armies were defeated by the Soviet Union in 1945, they were utterly completely demoralized, and well, and they uh, they um, that surrendered to the United States. Now, in other words, the bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were a minor factor in that decision. I'll repeat that. That the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki didn't figure largely in the Japanese decision to start to surrender. Yeah, was, they were ready. It was the defeat of their land armies in Manchuria. So why were the bombs dropped? Good question. The bombs were dropped to test them. And what, 100,000 people at, um, at Nagasaki and about 80,000 at Hiroshima were slaughtered to test these weapons by the United States. And that is why Mary feels very guilty about it. So I'll let people think about that a little bit and ponder on it. Um, but basically, I hope that people will take the view that the Manhattan Project is not a good thing. But may I ask something? Do you think if Ukraine didn't give up its nuclear weapon, Putin would have attacked it like he did? You know, because I read about that a lot. Mm -hmm. So I didn't catch that, Luba. Oh, do you think if Ukraine didn't give up its nuclear weapons, Putin would have attacked it the way he did? I don't know the answer to that question. Basically, um, I think we should ex explain to the uh, participants that um, when after the Soviet Union in 1990, the Soviet Union basically collapsed, um, and what we were left with was a, a group of about 17 um, individual republics, one of which was Russia, and another one of which was Ukraine, which were independent of each other. Um, Ukraine had many Soviet weapons, nuclear weapons on its soil, and in its ships. <clears throat> and um, and what happened was that in 1991, I seem to recall, um, this, the Russian Republic and the fledgling Ukraine Republic um, negotiated a series of agreements whereby um, um, there was bilateral aid would be given from Russia to Ukraine in return for Ukraine sending its uh, the Soviet nuclear weapons into Russia. It wasn't the case of Ukraine voluntarily giving up their weapons. They never had them. These were Soviet weapons. Right. It happened to be in Ukrainian soil and ships. Um, so um, back in 1991, the, the, there was a lot of swapping back and forth. Um, and nuclear weapons was one of the things which were swapped back and forth. So um, that's the situation there. Now, as to why Putin invaded um, Ukraine, <laughs> uh, well, books have been written about that. Um, it's, um, it's crazy. It's uh, Russian imperialism that is worst. Um, look what happened to Chechnya. Yeah. Look what happened at Chechnya. Georgia too. Georgia. And the same thing is happening to happening to Ukraine. Um, it's getting a bit dark now, and uh, both in terms of the conversation and also here, it's, it's getting dark. Um, and I think I'm not going to say anything more about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Irina, I think. Thank you, Irina. I think there's a, 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 there is another answer to your question from Cindy. She says on the question of pregnancy, you might want to check Alexei Yablokov's book. 
Uh, the research is a bit older, but it covers some research not available in the West. Chernobyl consequences of the catastrophe for people and the environment. Thank you, Cindy. Cindy, we immediately ordered yeah. it to the. Yes, I would write, um, recommend that. Um, the, the book is, thank you, Cindy, for reminding me about that. Um, uh, this book by um, Yabrokov, Nesterenko, and Nesterenko. Um, um, it um, basically contains a great deal of information about what happened at Chernobyl, after Chernobyl. And it has been denigrated in the United States, but it, it still is very good. It's very difficult to read, I, I should I must add to you. Um, in fact, um, and Mary's gone, but what I did was that I, I extracted various parts of the book and sent them to Mary um, concerning um, mental effects. Um, and ju the, the gist of my email was that um, the Yablokov book didn't really look at mental health effects as such like ptsd it looked at effects on the brain um which is a totally different matter but um it uh, does con the, the the yabrakov book does contain um evidence of effects during pregnancy but um i would add to that that um it's a generalization that the closer you get back to the moment of conception, the more dangerous radiation is. In other words, that um, the effects on um, uh, embryos are greater than the effects on the fetus, and on the effects of newborns, and the effects of infants, um, and to children. So, and the, in other words, the closer that you go back to the moment of conception, the more dangerous radiation is, always. Now, just to give you one instance of that, and that is that a, a woman called Alice Stewart in the 1950s and 60s found that when she, um, when women were um, irradiated uh, for um, in utero for, um, which was standard practice back in the 1950s, she found that their children, the the level of leukemias in the children were double that than what she expected, right? Um, basically, this was um, extremely alarming because the doses that the, the pregnant women were getting were relatively small from x-rays. And, um, and, a, and a, the effects were doubling the rate of leukemia in the subsequent children. Um, this is a, there's a long story here written by a great book in a great book called The Woman Who Knew Too Much. And that was Alice Stewart. And it, this book is written by Gail, G-A-Y-L-E, Green, G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E, and it's available online. You Google The Woman Who Knew Too Much. Um, and the story is that the medical profession and the nuclear industry and the weapons industry all ganged up against Alan Stewart and refuted her evidence and said it wasn't true, it was wrong, and invented various excuses as to why it uh, occurred. But she, um, Alice Stewart is no longer with us, obviously. Um, she uh, has been vindicated and her findings are in fact correct. Now, with that, I'm just say one more sentence, uh, yeah, and that is this. Um, myself, along with Cindy, are, we're actually writing a book. We've been commissioned to write a book by an outfit called The Ethics Press um, into the life stories of many radiation scientists who were badly treated. And yet um, their findings have been vindicated. Um, for shorthand, we call these people radiation heroes, but they're thinking of a better title. Um, but um, so we're on the trail. We're, now we're looking at people like Rosalie Bertel. We're looking at people like Tamplin and Goffman and Sternglass and Alan Stewart 
They were all right. And yet they were badly, badly treated, trashed by the medical profession and by the nuclear power profession and by the various governments. So watch this space and the book will be published next year. Thank you, Yale, for allowing me to go on at great length. Absolutely. So, <laughs> you, knew, you knew I would. <laughs> and, uh, Irina, there's quite a bit of, uh, you, you are familiar, and I, I know you are familiar, but I'd like to mention to the audience, from the field of multi-generational legacies of trauma, of course, the pertinent work is of Rachel Yehuda, of women who were pregnant during 9-11 and the results for the babies. And there's a follow-up all this time. Uh, very, uh, so there's so much to look at. And, and thank you again for mentioning the book as well. Uh, Jean Boda, of course, we want it in the library, and of course, when it comes out, we, we will have a launch event. This is a formal invitation. <laughs> Please say yes. Okay, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, good. Uh, Jean Boda is extremely active on, on the chat. Please, uh, please read his directions as to how to join his, and, and, and not only advocacy, but to join uh, in, uh, you know, an event uh, on this Thursday on the 27th. Uh, but John disagrees with you, Ian, that the book by Nestorenko and yeah, Volkov is difficult to read. <laughs> I could barely put it down. Well, John, we well, are different people. <laughs> good for you, John. Well done. Keep on reading it, okay? Yeah, read it for all of us. <laughs> Memorize every single bloody word, okay? Good for you. Well done. There is. And Luba, you have a very, very full hearted. Uh, uh, but, 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 I'll have to say, yeah. Um, the reason why I said it's difficult is that um, the, the authors are Russian um, and one in, in, in Belarusian, and they use medical terminology which doesn't fit in with what is, um, exists in the West, okay? Um, um, and it, so it's very difficult to, to, to relate to what they're finding with what's actually what the medical situation is here in, in, in Europe. It's true that, um, um, that they, um, they do mention WHO categories, International Classification of Diseases, ICD, which makes it much better, um, but they don't always do it, only now and again. Um, I am not putting down the, the book by um, Yablokov, Nesterenko, Nesterenko, I take my hats off to them, about only one is now living. Um, and I think that what they did was wonderful. Uh, it's very good indeed. Um, indeed, I was, um, I have written a book review after the book. It's, uh, it's published in a peer reviewed journal. Um, the journal is called Radiation Protection Dissymmetry from, I think it was 2016. Um, and if people would like, me to dig it out and send them a link to that book review. Fine, it's about four pages long, in which I congratulate them for their book, okay? So Jan, don't get me wrong, okay? I said it's difficult to read because in, in certain areas, the medical classification system we use doesn't agree with what's going on in the West, okay? Uh Luba, you have a particular mention from Hazel Antaramian Hoffman, who is an Armenian uh, artist, who is giving you very, very warm recognition. And she's also now um, pointing out the, uh, the trauma of the people of Isaac. Thank you, Hazel. First of all, please write to me immediately. My email is very simple. It's Y-A-E-L-D 
at AOL.com. Uh, we do have other Armenian artists. Actually, we had it and we had a special event last year uh, with a film from Artsakh. So please be in touch with me because I, I'd like you to be part of the networking of, and we have a special working group on, on the arts, uh, not just visual, all the arts as well. So um, I want to, uh, th there are so many other important, uh, it, this is an amazingly engaged audience. God bless you for being with us and for asking all these important questions and asking for further thought. Janice Wilton has been uh, very patient uh, with a Q&A question. Uh, she is wondering from a psychological perspective, when everyone is aware of the nuclear accidents like Chernobyl and the dangers of nuclear power and nuclear waste, and especially now that we have renewables like wind and solar to deal with a climate crisis, why so many of our leaders are still pushing nuclear, including small module nuclear reactors that they want to sell around the world? Is there a willful stupidity factor here? An average citizen can see these dangers, but the leaders of many countries still seem intent on pushing more nuclear. I'd like to answer that. I know. Thank but, you. Uh, I, I thought it was... You raise a very good question, Janice. Thank you for asking it. Um, no, they're not stupid. Um, immoral, yes. Um, unethical, yes. Uh, Short-sighted, yes, but they're not stupid. The main reason why people want nuclear power stations to continue is to get nuclear weapons. That's the main reason. Okay. I said earlier on, I explained that the direct umbilical link between nuclear weapons and nuclear power. So they need to have to have the nuclear power stations so they can get the fissile material to make bombs. Now, do you think that um, this is a figment of my imagination? Unfortunately, it's not. Look what happened with India. India promised in a stack of Bibles to Canada that uh, if they gave them some nuclear reactors, they would not build bombs. That's the first thing they did. They broke that promise. Happened also in Pakistan. As soon as India got weapons, nuclear weapons, Pakistan wanted them. They, they swore on a stack of Bibles to the United States that they would not build nuclear weapons. They did. So Pakistan and India, who are, have got religious differences, um, are now facing each other, both with nuclear weapons, because they, got, they, were, they were obtained from nuclear power stations. Look what's going on in Iran right now, with the continual argy-bargy going on about building uranium enrichment facilities. <laughs> Do you think, and your, Iran says this is so they can build nuclear power stations. No, they are one of the weapons. And it's the same thing, look at Saudi Arabia, not a very friendly country, which um, is sitting on mountains of oil and gas, says, uh, please, energy poverty, that says it, it cannot, it's not got any energy, it says. So it needs to build nuclear power stations. Do you believe that? Of course not. It, it wants to get its hands on nuclear weapons. So that's the reason why, Janice, why they, keep, they want to keep on building new nuclear reactors. And you may say, well, why new ones? Well, because the old ones are basically shutting down. Uh, in every country in the world, um, nuclear reactors are coming to the end of their useful lives, and, um, which is about 30 years, sometimes 40. Um, and they're all about 30, 40 years old. And in, particularly in Britain, you used to have about 16 reactors. Now it's down to about five. Germany had 19 reactors. They've closed every single one of them. Oh, and by the way, 
So if Germany can close all its nuclear reactors, so can any, uh, any country in the world. In the United States, same, it used to have 104 reactors, now down to about 90 odds. I, um, I don't know exact number, but um, many of the reactors are closing down. And the warmongers want, want to build more nuclear reactors to get the fissile material to make bombs. And tritium, by the way, which is used in hydrogen bombs as a, a trigger and as a reflector. So um, I'll, that, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Janice, thank you. As much as it's possible to answer. Thank you. I, I promised everyone that each of the speakers will have last words. <laughs> uh, Luba, you were the last speaker. Would you start, please? <laughs> well, um, I think despite everything that's going on in the world, I feel optimistic by listening this language and reason and, and uh, hoping that, that we will be able to, to end up this war in Ukraine and uh, just do better things for, for the entire humanity, but also I know that nothing will replace all these uh, victims that died during Chernobyl or now what's happening in Ukraine. So it's really important to, yeah, to spread the knowledge, to ask people to think, to keep them informed with real news, not with fake news, not with um, all that stupid culture that we are drowned with, you know, that's very, very important. So, yeah. Trying to stay hopeful as an artist, as a person, <laughs> and keeping busy, you know. I think that's the best, actually, medicine to, to keep optimistic. Yeah. Thank you, dear. Oksana, you have to unmute. I, yeah, so I think I want to more come back to dedicate to all the Ukrainians who tomorrow is the anniversary and to all of who survived and always remember and think of those days and uh, its aftermath, because uh, I wanted to speak to the fact that Ukrainians survived that event uh, uh, after a, a tremendous history of genocides and oppressions and violence, living in Soviet Union, and especially at that time was extremely repressive. For those of us who received um, not just no help, but I would say uh, opposite of help and the kind of misinformation and problematic treatment post event that uh, lives on in our lives, in our minds. And uh, to all the Ukrainians and then my fellow Ukrainian diasporans and refugees that right now as Russia attacks that um, it is such a recapitulation of the kind of the sense of that nuclear threat, not, not from the Soviet stations that were placed in Ukraine in great proportion, and that's what Russia is attacking, but also because they are repeatedly uh, threatening Ukrainians with uh, nuclear attacks and nuclear threats. And I understand I'm correctly my wrong, I looked it up that Russia possesses more nuclear weapons than all the most almost all other countries combined in the world. And so to stop countries like Russia to amassing such weaponry and then using it, I think it's world's responsibility and maybe scientists responsibility too. But to all Ukrainians who survived the psychological torture of such threats and attacks, I just want to also say, um, hold on and uh, we, victory will be ours and Slava Ukraini, yeah. Ian? I've I've had a, a good butt of the cherry already, uh, Yale. Yeah, but um, okay. I'll, no, no. I'll just say I totally agree with you, Oksana. Um, um, my prayers are with Ukraine. I um, I very much hope that they will win this this war with uh, um, with uh, Russia and and. Um, um, and I do hope that um, all of us um, will have learned something from the seminar, from this webinar, 
um, and that uh, you will continue your activities um, by joining the, the various groups that I've mentioned um, and keep going and keep informing yourself, keep, be aware. Um, and um, may I say to you, uh, Dr. Daniele, I thank you very much. And I look forward to speaking to you again, okay? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Irina, do you have a last word, darling? <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much again for having me among the panelists. Uh, and um, so tomorrow I have an honor to, yeah, to uh, brief uh, the round table that Professor Tabachnikov will chair uh, in Kiev together with many other organizations, associations and research institutions that dedicated their like um, research to, to Chernobyl. And uh, one important uh, gap, uh, I, I uh, like we all, I think, identified that the mental health consequences of this uh, disaster were not studied properly, and maybe it's it's time, it's never too late to start to do that. Thank you, and uh, Slava Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we keep going. We simply keep going. And everybody who joined us, keep with us, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And